yeah, thank you very much. Thank you guys for inviting me. I'm really honored to be here and um, to meet uh, all the new friends. Um, under that, that banner of reframe, I think uh, what I'm going to try to do today is to try to reframe um, to some core topics in interaction design and to look through them on, um, on social change and vice versa. So th this reframing between design and, uh, and political activism um, is a part of what I'm trying to do today. So I'm Sean. Uh, I was already introduced, so we can move, move forward with that. Um, so I'm going to talk about, the, the talk is going to be uh, broken to uh, five steps, flowing, affording, the curve, future topologies, and friction mapping. None of this is supposed to, to, to say anything to you right now, but hopefully by the end of the talk it would. So let's start flowing. So flow, flow has been this ongoing theme in, um, in culture in general. And uh, but both in the East and the West, uh, you can see the, the flow, the, this uh, constant kind of almost liquid change be, being um, an inspiration for uh, philosophy, for uh, sports, for, um, for aesthetics, in many, many uh, different uh, fields. Definitely uh, this inspiration from nature about how change happens in nature is embodied in this idea of the flow. The, the flow is, is a concept coming from um, um, physics, right? And, uh, and we can, uh, we can uh, see how we have looked at, at flow as, um, as an inspiration and, and trying to see how does it affect our understanding of change. So let's say I want to buy this book. It's called Flow. It touches on similar issues. Um, if I go to Amazon, I would be presented with a flow, this time an interaction flow. And uh, this interaction flow is actually presented through this uh, little widget that says, I'm signing in, shopping, I have a gift option, and then I place the order. Basically what Amazon is trying to do is to get me as soon as possible to actually approving um, the transaction. And in general, uh, Amazon has been um, pretty known for trying to minimize the friction on the way to me actually getting my product, right? So this could be seen as friction, as something that is opposing the flow to some degree. And this is also friction. And actually, even the idea of me wanting and approving this uh, and starting this flow is, is uh, considered friction. And we can see how the world has been, has been obsessed about uh, getting rid of friction. And, um, and when, we, when we look at it, when we look at flow and the associations of this word, uh, we can see words like well forth, move, proceed. Flow is the good thing, right? And with friction, um, well, friction, bad feeling, disharmony, erosion, right? In general, we want everything faster, simpler, cheaper, less cognitive load, less emotional load, less responsibility, more automatic, in other, more predictable. In other words, frictionless. But what did, did this frictionlessness bring us? Inequality political polarization, post-truth, mental health crisis, and environmental collapse. We've been, we, we, all of these have, have, uh, have been um, the result of no friction. And to some degree we can see um, our planet kind of um, slipping between our fingers for lack of friction. And, but what is frictionlessness really? We can imagine a drop of water in space, even that, that is in frictionlessness, frictionless. As soon as it drops to the Earth um, and, and meets, uh, it meets the friction of gravity of the atmosphere, and as soon as it, as it meets the Earth, it starts flowing. 
downstream, right? So the the friction of the of the natural environment um, doesn't only it doesn't oppose the flow; it actually shapes and directs the flow. So friction and flow are not concepts that are uh, contradictory; they are complementary, and uh, and that would be important for us as we as we go okay, yeah. okay stop now stop stop we gently flow down the river okay forward guys forward forward fast forward suddenly friction We've been swept into a diverging stream, swirling and swaying in the turbulent white waters, bashing against the rocks and the whirlpools in the river. In spring 2020, the predictable flow of our status quo abruptly diverged by the coronavirus. Our flows have always been mostly local. Traditionally, the classic subject, small talk, is the weather, the turbulent environmental flow that situates our lives. In the past few dec decades, globalization shifted the flows of goods, information, people, pollution, and viruses to a global scale. But since tw spring 2020, our small talks are all channeled through the turbulent flow of the pandemic. COVID-19 framed every aspect of our lives, death tolls, lockdowns, quarantines, Travel bans, social distancing, face masks, vaccination, tests, vi video conferencing. We were not in our best health when it started. And indeed, the pandemic exposes and amplifies many of society's pre-existing conditions. Again, inequality, political polarization, post-truth, mental health crisis, and environmental collapse. Each society dealt with the pandemic differently, but at the same time, we have also been dealing with it together. Despite the wide impacts of past pandemics, world wars, and the nuclear age, for the first time with COVID-19, all of humanity have found itself not on the same boat, but caught in the same turbulent stream, fighting for every breath, just trying to keep our heads above the water. The pandemic is arguably the most significant global friction event. But, is it definitely, but it is definitely not the last. For years now, climate change has been a steadily increasing global crisis, yet we do not experience it globally at the same time, and we have yet to acknowledge it and to address it as global friction. Both our warming planet and the virus are invisible to us. Those scales are either too big or too small for us to see with our naked eyes. How can we identify possibility for action in the environment? How can we change what we can't see? The soft soil provides the, the rabbits with the affordance to dig a hole. J.J. Gibson uh, defined the affordances uh, as the, the, if there, if there, Defined affordances as, uh, as what the environment are, um, the affordances of the environment are what it offers the animal. So if the, the rabbit is too young, too old, too sick, the affordance will be affected. If we pave over the soil, the affordance would be affected. So when, when we're talking about affordance, we're not talking about something that exists in the environment or in the animal. It exists between the, the two. In 1988, Don Norman introduced affordances to design to discuss, for example, how a chair may afford sitting, standing on to switch a light bulb, and smashing on somebody's head. Electric affordances are abstract. It's, it starts from the fundamental abstraction of electricity. We're not actually um, flowing then the electricity into the system we are affecting the closing of the, of the circuit. And that is already a first step of abstraction. So zero and one, off and on. To understand them, we depend on a representative layer. We, so so this, uh, representative, this abstractive abstraction 
for re representation is, um, is needed. So digital affordances extrapolate that. So think about, um, about the zero and one on the level of the digital that pretty much explodes. So um, d digital affordances are not something we can see with our naked eyes or feel with our paws. In 2013, Norman release, released the second edition of the Design of Everyday Things and admitted that affordances have created much confusion in the world of design. Norman re referred to the invisible affordances of software represented through, through the design of user interfaces. He suggested a nuance. Affordances define what actions are possible and signifiers specify how we discover possibility. So signifiers are signs communicating what can be done. D digitization means a growing divide between affordances and signifiers. So, for example, this is a desktop. And this is, of course, home. You are always home. You have your phone at home. You have your, um, your files at home. You have your camera home. You have your um, letters home. You have your notes home. And of course, home is where the heart is. Signifiers of abstraction, uh, these are signifiers of abstraction. There's no direct link be between the affordance. Think about the, the, the phone handle. Like, how many of you have held the phone handle like that recently? Like, no, it becomes an icon, a representation. Um, there is a, it comes with a certain price. We are dependent on a thin layer of representation, which is our sole connection to the underlying affordance, to, to, what, to what is possible, to making any type of change in the world. And when that sole connection to the world is lost, one second. Um, okay, sorry. No, no. Interaction monitoring systems like Full Story, Hotjar, and others call these behaviors rage clicks. They may seem like minor frictions in the daily interaction flow, but they represent micro doses of pure horror, of losing the only connection to the world you are trying to change, complete powerlessness. Let's go back in time to consider how people power worked in the past. So we're going quite backwards to 1324, Bruges, Flanders, today's Belgium. In September 1324, a mob of angry Flemish peasants gathered at the gates of their lord's castle. The time for negotiation was over, and the mob stormed the castle with torches and pitchforks. The noblemen that managed to escape the mob were caught by the flames. A monk, mortified by what he saw as the reversal of the natural social order, described it as the plague of people rebelling against their superiors. These are affordances. Fire is an affordance for violence. People, more people holding more torches means more power. So there was a direct correlation between people and power. Not very elegant, but still. Let's move forward. 1842, Britain, the Industrial Revolution changed the affordances of power. We find ourselves now at the gates of the factory. So um, this, uh, this marked the first general strike in history. Um, and, um, and, and this time, again, there was a direct affordance between 
less, less hands on the machines means more power, uh, less power for the industrialists to produce. So when, when, when the strike was, uh, was declared, the, the more people you, you get on your side, the more power you get. Let's fast forward to 2011, Wall Street, NYC. At the gates of the Wall Street Stock Exchange, is this gate a fr presenting friction? Is the protest demonstrating people power? Where are the affordances? I would argue these are signifiers. These, even this is, is a signifier, not only because this is not uh, uh, the Wall Street Stock Exchange, but the Federal Court Building, but because this is representing layers and layers and layers of signifiers that signify other signifiers, and, and they push the affordance away. That building was four minutes away. Um, the, the, the Stock Exchange itself was four minutes away, placed in a, at a narrow street that accidentally does not afford protest. Um, so Zuccotti Park was a signifier, but Wall Street itself is a signifier. That building signifies the financial system, but, but it doesn't contain it, okay? This is not where power lies. It's a symbol of where power lies. So more people does not mean more power, like we've seen in the past. And this is on, not only on the left. Let's go to Charlottesville, 2017. I'm sorry if this is bringing bad memories. So again, people holding torches. This time it's uh, tiki torches that they bought at Ace. Um, but these are signifiers to what? This is, this is signifiers to the, the, the same torches that were held back then. But where is the gate? Where is the affordance to power? It is not there. And we, can, and we can see that again in January 6, Capitol Hill. This is a very traumatic event for, for, for Americans, for sure. But this, these are signifiers. Even if events would have, I would argue that, that even if events would have been worse that day, um, that, would, that is not the only gate, the one, uh, the one point of friction that would change um, American democracy, arguably. This is a rage click. But I'm not here to tell you why we're powerless. I want to show you how we are powerful. Let's go back to 2012. A club called LPR in New York and online. This is a poster for a benefit, you know, when the tickets uh, proceed go to, to, to some NGO, then that's always kind of nice. That's affordance. It's good to fund NGOs that are doing good things. But that was not the point. Rolling Jubilee is a strike debt project that buys debt for pennies on the dollar. But instead of collecting it, it abolishes it. What, what, they, what they did is they, they fundraised money and became a debt collector. When, you, when you're a debt collector, you, you, buy, you buy debt in penny on the dollar, and usually you, you make uh, people's lives miserable to get the, the full amount of the debt. What, what they did was exactly the opposite. So people got a, a little package like this, a little red pa package with a letter inside that, sa that said um, many things, including, you no longer owe the balance of this debt. It is gone. A gift with no strings attached. And as we know by now, this is definitely affordance. This is changing people's lives. But they did not stop there. Debt collective, um, they, 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 don't, they don't need to, they, they understood that they don't need to walk into the gates of, of Wall Street. They are already there. They unionized uh, debtors to go on a, on a strike, uh, generally saying, you are not alone. Um, and they released a book called Con Can't Pay, Won't Pay. And they continued. They lobbied three presidents for 10 years. And, and you can see, alone, alone our debts are a burden. Together they make us powerful. Again, a direct correlation between people and power. 
through, even through the, 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 the very weak element of death. And, and, and then it, directs, it goes directly to um, the, the, the friction that they're making here is directed at a specific action. Pick up the penjo. And this is just last, last month. August 24th, White House, D.C. Using the authority Congress granted the Department of Education, we will forgive $10,000 in outstanding federal student loans. In addition, students who come from low-income families, which allowed them to qualify to receive a Pell Grant, will have their debt reduced $20,000. This is a change of the flow. And it, and it comes from a reading of friction and flow and of affordances and signifiers that, that looks for the opportunities where we have correlations between people and power. This, is bringing, this means that more people means more power, and they are not done yet. So when we go, come back to this division between affordances and signifiers, we can think of affordances as what is possible in the present, and signifiers as how we discover future possibility. So we need to, to try to understand how do we signify action that would get us to change the flow. And all of this talk of signifiers, the, that, that brings us back to design. So signifier and design are both drawn from, from the same source. To design is both to plan towards a future we cannot see and to create the plans that show how, that give shape to these invisible futures, to what may lie ahead of the curve. Let's talk about the curve. Pretty early in 2020, this was the way we visualized the possible futures of the pandemic. Flattening the curve was, the, was both a chart and the call to action. It focused on two mitigation scenarios and advocated flattening the peaks of hospitalizations to avoid overwhelming our health systems. However, it accidentally also visualized a future affordance for flattening the end of the curve back to pre-COVID levels. It suggested that if we just hold our breath long enough, all of this will be over. On one hand, it overpromised, but on the other hand, it inspired resilience. We know now this was a false hope, an empty signifier. With new variants, sl slow and partial vaccination, then boosters, and no herd immunity or cure in sight, with another curve and another curve and another curve, we, ha we are still deep in troubled waters. But the hope of resilience, uh, but the hope of resilience inspired by this chart provided the anticipation we needed for action and adaptability, both personally, locally, and globally. Climate change provides us with a similar chart, also comparing different scenarios. But what futures that is in, does it inspire? And what possibilities that is, does it give shape to? Comparing between different carbon scenarios, the, the temperature rise, and the different disastrous level simply does not inspire action. This chart visualized, visualizes that if we act quickly to dramatically change almost every aspect of our lives, we just might be able to enjoy one scenario of, of, uh, one, scenario of one horrible environmental collapse and not the other, even worse scenario of environmental collapse. It demands, us, it, de it demands we give up our privileged present immediately and begin enduring the, this cat catastrophic future right now. Flattening the curve message of resilience, saying, hold on, this would soon be over. Global temperature prediction basically anticipates the apocalypse, saying, we have literally nothing to look forward to. The first is an aspirational model advocating action. It is inspired, but is not driven by data. The second is a forecast driven by data. It is not driven by or encouraging action. If we, if we think about, uh, if we compare the timescales, we can also see the urgency that, uh, that we managed to, uh, to build around, uh, around the pandemic, another challenge when, when it comes to climate change.
So how can we, how can we go beyond this apocalyptic chart and inform action in the present? Back to design. We need to plan and we need to create. We need something to look forward to. We need truly pluralistic futures, to future topologies to navigate through our changing climate. Looking downstream, we can identify five different futures, futures topologies, five different flows. As we go through them, remember they are not inherently good or bad, but they do represent di different anticipations for, for stability or for change. Continuation. The, pr the first one would be continuation, basically saying the present is here to stay. Existing patterns aren't threatened by change. For example, it's just the common flu. Climate change is a liberal hoax. Nothing to worry about. Don't mind the, mind the friction, just go with the flow. No matter how, how the river bends or swirls, the inertia of the past is strong and reliable. So none of, this, uh, of it really threatens the mainstream. Collapse. Our flows, are, as we used to know them, are over. Pandemic dystopia, environmental extinction, robot apocalypse, but also ending our reliance of, on carbon energy, right? The river runs dry, and, and if, you, if you think about it, it's very digital. Continuation being one, collapse being zero, this is kind of limiting our imagination, very binary. Resilience, acknowledging the, volati the volatility of the status quo, but believing change is preventable. Flatten the curve post-COVID, preventing climate change, but also fears of white genocide and, main and maintaining white supremacy. It is always back to a discourse of resilience, of preventing an undesirable future. This is temporary inconvenience. While change is alarming, it should be avoided. Uh, so we can hopefully get back to our familiar flow. Adaptability. We never really flattened the curve. Post-COVID never really happened. Instead, we learned how to live with the pandemic. This is a slightly different flow. Living in a warmer, less predictable climate with different affordances how may these new flows change us? For example, the great climate migration is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Shouldn't we start recognizing this thick present may soon be ours? We used to be a migratory species. We may find ourselves needing to, ado to adopt to that again. The flow diverges to numerous possible flows be beyond our current imagination. This makes the ground less stable, on one hand prone to flooding, on the other hand extremely fertile. It, it requires us to build the, the, flexi the flexibility and openness to anticipate and act within the, this landscape of complexity. Dramatic environmental changes may block some flows, but I, wa I, wa I want to argue that they may also open new ones. Solopunk is, a, is an emerging genre in science fiction and design, which unlike its cyberpunk pr predecessor, is utopian, equitable, desirable, and exciting. Solar power provides not only sustainable energy, but also inspiration as a natural resource of abundance one that cannot be privatized and requires, uh, and requires a network of sharing. It imagines di distributing both solar and political power. It is a future to look forward to. Apparently, solar punk is already so desirable that some people already use it to sell yogurt. Sound? Dear Alice, this place is yours now. It's a handful, but nothing worth doing is easy. The land is more than just dirt. If you look after it 
it will feed you forever. You're a smart one. I know you'll be okay come rain or shine. And remember, a business is only as good as its people. So treat them well. Our job is to plant seeds so our grandkids get to enjoy the fruit. So, eat well, Alice, and keep planting those seeds. Because how we eat today feeds tomorrow. So as you can see, uh, the product placement is already there. We just need to build the world around it. <laughs> <clears throat> we often think that there, there can only be one flow, only one way of living. But every now and then, two flows combine or diverge, forever changing the, the world we've known before, providing new possibilities and new hopes. These five topologies are not mutually exclusive. They often intertwine. Different flows will demand different futures ethics. And to design them, we will need to both connect our futures back to, to, to the present and to map their frictions. So we can see that if we continue downstream or, or, or just like nothing happened or just think that there's nothing for us to do, this is where it leads us. We can think about resilience to some degree, but we also should think about adaptability and transformation. These are also possibilities for political imagination. Friction mapping is one of the techniques I use both in, in my, for my design work, in my creative practice, and as a futures and fu foresight facilitator. Speculative tourism is a project I lead with Shalev Moran. We created audio tools from the futures of cities. It started in 2017 in Jerusalem, and the latest iteration is currently up in the Manifesta Biennial in Pristina, Kosovo. We worked with four local authors, we, and we gave them workshops and led them through a speculative writing process. At the end, each created an audio tour of her or his future in Pristina. Shalev and I cre also created Sea Change as an online speculative tourism project. I in it, we backcast the future of geoengineering the, the sea levels of the Mediterranean. Our backcasting starts at the year 2104, and through tweets, Instagram posts, Wikipedia articles, and YouTube videos, goes all the way back to the 1920s. It involves the, the construction of a huge dam on the Strait of Gib Gibraltar in a resilient attempt to regulate the sea levels. This is apparently not only a crazy idea, it is also one that was extensively explored in the past. This is a video from 1951. Without giving too much away from, uh, from the plot, the frictions along the way, uh, and the frictions along the way, I would say the storyline meanders through all five change topologies. Continuation, collapse, resilience, adaptability, and transformation. You can check this out and other maps exploring environmental water issues around the Mediterranean at medlic.art. The process we developed for authors also inspired a set of foresight workshops on mobility, starting with mobility policies in Israel. We started by, by raising issues of uncertainty and used two by two axes to identify both preferred and less preferred transportation futures. Then we used the backcasting technique to draft a, a scenario that connects each of these futures back to the present. Friction mapping builds on the scenario planning, the, on scenario planning that identifies a plausible scenario from a future of interest into the, into the present. Friction mapping argues that no future simply flows with no resistance, undisturbed. The future is the resistance endured in the future scenario. Mapping friction in the, in the path towards a preferred future would allow us to anticipate future frictions on the way to these futures and to start acting today. For example, in the case of transportation futures, we discussed religious, uh, 
we discussed re religious leaders in Israel's blanket uh, resistance to public transportation on, sa on Saturday, the Holy Sabbath. This friction in the, in the thick present pre pre provides us with an opportunity to encourage religious leaders to already clear the, the way for autonomous public transportation in the near future. The, the friction of, uh, on the way to less preferred futures may have been able to change the flow. In these cases, we need to become the, fu the friction. For example, on a, on a governmental level, use regulations, legislations, and, and, st and strategic taxation to, neg to negotiate the terms of entry for companies like Uber, preventing them from holding the market uh, hostage like they do in other places in the world. Uber does not operate in Israel. Um, the, we've been developing these um, uh, new methodologies that are kind of as friction mapping, um, mixing from design, from futures, and from complexity studies. So you can see that um, um, also in the format of a workshop. I'm not really going into the details of that, but uh, in general, we track variable change influence in, in, in a network um, kind of system perspective, system dynamics perspective. And then um, we look for variable contradictions. Um, we map balancing stock changes. We add friction points and expand, uh, and then expand the map. And finally, identify the sources of fr for friction to uh, find opportunities for action. Friction means we can act. I'll give you just a short example from another project. Um, we created ad nauseum an ad blocker that generates strategic friction to fight against surveillance advertising. We will watch just, just a short clip from this trailer. Ad nauseum. Clicking ads so you don't have to. The ad nauseum plugin works in concert with your favorite ad blocker. Every ad blocked is then silently clicked by ad nauseum confusing your data trackers by virtually liking all ads. Within your browser, the Ad Nauseam add-on collects and visualizes your clickstream over time, giving you a small glimpse of the data you passively generate. Ad Nauseam works in the background and does not interfere with your browser. Point your browser at this URL and install Ad Nauseam now. Spread the word and help us code as we work to make ad nauseum better and to bring it to more people and more browsers. Finally, to the ad industry, we would like to say it is time to be respectful of our privacy expectations. Let's work together towards an honest and meaningful do not track standard. Until that day comes, be sure we will keep pushing your buttons. All of them. So, so the reason that I'm showing you this is because, because in this case we use something as passive as online advertising and identified clicks as gates. So interfaces are gates. Gates introduce friction. Friction allows action. She's on the horizon. I go two steps, she moves two steps away. I walk 10 steps, and the horizon runs 10 steps ahead. No matter how much I walk, I will never reach her. What good is utopia? That's what. It's good for walking. This talk has been a part of, the, my, of my upcoming uh, book, um, Friction and Flow. And I would love for you to challenge me uh, with some constructive friction to constrain and direct my writing flow. Thank you very much. So uh, we have not a lot of time for, t for questions, but we do have some time. So please, questions, remark, friction, please. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to know a little bit more about the 
immigration mapping workshops that you've done in the past? How does that process, what does it look like, and what have you done with so, the, so I'm working, uh, uh, yeah, so I was asked about the friction mapping workshops. Um, so the, we, we, we have kind of two types of uh, workshops. One with the aim of uh, creating more, more of a narrative output, which is uh, the speculative tourism workshops. Uh, one of them we actually did in uh, New London with uh, Nadav, who's here. Um, a couple of years ago, um, and the others are more uh, focused on policy and action. Um, so, but but the interesting thing is that they're using some of the same tools. the The idea is to start with mapping the system, ma mapping the present, and 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 this is an, an important element because it's really important to understand that all of the conversation of the future or futures is always to identify opportunities in the present. It's not only th this this um, kind of uh, entertainment uh, idea of look how exciting or dark the future looks like. And I must, must say I have a lot of problems with the way design has been handling futures so far. Like the only reason for us to, to talk about the futures is to understand how do they inform what we do in the present. So that's something very, very um, basic for our reading of the system in the present the possibility for the system to change in the futures, to change for the better, to change for the worse, to change for the other, right? Because when we, um, especially when we're, when we're playing with this, um, I, may, I may jump to that, to that slide to illustrate that. So, so you, you saw the, the network map. So, so in, in this case, you can see we had four groups. Each one of them uh, considered another layout uh, and, and another um, flow within uh, within the the system, including how the system may change in the pr in the future to accommodate changes in 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 the var variables of the of the network. It's kind of con complex, but um, but the point is that it really al allows us to think uh, really widely um, and to try to find where do we identify. Um, connections. Where do we? Where, where can we slow things down? Uh, make things happen faster. Block some things. Open new paths. It's uh, and 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 we would do that towards preferred futures and away from less preferred futures. Yes. So I'll, I'll repeat the, the question. So, so how are designers and, uh, and scientists are supposed to work together with different kind of, uh, let's say, aesthetics of uh, looking at the future? Um, I think, you know, I, I might be, there is a certain problem with prediction algorithms. I, I have a concern that prediction algorithms uh, have pretty much colonized our imagination. Um, they are considered the cutting edge of our technology, while when you look at how prediction algorithms actually work, they are conservative by design. The only thing that they can do is to either say the patterns of the past would repeat themselves, or they won't. It's that zero or, or one, it's that uh, continuation or collapse. They are not able to, they're, they're really limited in their ability to provide resilience, and they ha they're useless for adaptability, and they cannot even, you know, they're, they're not a part of the conversation for transformation. So, um, so we have to, I'm not, I'm not saying we should throw it away, and it's really important to understand that continuation is what we mostly are trying to do. We're trying to live our lives the way we know them. Like, we're not trying to change every element of our lives. This century is going to change a lot of elements of our lives. So we cannot, even, even 
even uh, climate predictions, which are essential for our, for our lives, we use them to make sure that they won't come true, right? These are predictions that we need to work against, right? So there is a problem between how the, these uh, scientific images of the future inform us and, and how they colonize our imagination. That, that's kind of a balance that we need to, to, uh, to kind of offset. And this is definitely on us. Yes. It's a, it's a small question. <laughs> what, what, what about AI? So uh, AI, um, the, the way, you know, AI is a big word, but the, the, the way the mainstream of machine learning uh, algorithms work today is exactly like prediction algorithms. They, they, they look at, at patterns from the past and they repeat them. It's kind of a parasitic technology. It's parasitic on the past. It cannot create futures that are not hinted in the past. So it's a very, you know, there's a lot of things to do with it. There's also a, a, a large um, environmental footprint that they create right now, so we need to take that into account because that's kind of hidden inside the cloud. Um, but we, when, when it comes to creativity and the concerns about, uh, about AI, both creativity for the creative process and for activism, we need to understand that they are still stuck between continuation and collapse. Thank you very much.